Welcome back to Script Analysis. Today we'll be looking at Character, which is Chapter 6. Um, Character is really central to understanding uh, good plays. Obviously, if you're an actor, you'll be portraying that character. If you're a costumer, you'll be enhancing that character with whatever costume you decide to put on. But often, you know, um, Aristotle talks about the importance of good characters to draw you into the story, that we care about these characters and uh, that they help us, help carry us through. Um, and um, so we'll be looking at Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, Pulitzer Prize winning play. Um, admittedly, really, really sad play right? Um, he set out to write a sort of Grecian tragedy in America. So when you sit down to read it and you think, man, this is different from anything I've ever read. Um, you know, Arthur Miller was very intentional about that and it paid off, right? He won, he won a Pulitzer for it. So, um, you know, you probably are familiar with Arthur Miller's other works, The Crucible, um, uh, View from the Bridge or All My Sons um, still get produced very often. Probably the most famous version is here with Dustin Hoffman starring as Willie Low Man and you can hear even in his last name that Arthur Miller you know wanted to pick a tragic hero who's the Low Man. Um, he's a salesman but we don't really know what he sells. Uh, it seems really that he's selling himself and um, the primary relationship it, it is a family play which many of these that we've talked about so far have been we said a lot of communities are based on the family um, but the primary relationship that we're seeing represented is between Willie and his son Biff he um, is really invested in Biff being a winner by his American values by his um, ideas of what a winner should be and Biff is is letting him down and Willie is letting himself down so there's this resentment between Willie and Biff that we see throughout the play um, Linda is hard uh, for me as as a modern woman um, because she's she's a doormat in a lot of ways she uh, is blind to a lot of things the same way Willie is I don't like the way Willie speaks to Linda <laughs> I don't like the way that um, Linda seems helpless to help in her family. Um, uh, you know, it's just one of those plays that's set in the 1950s, so it's representing different values than, than a lot of modern values. But, um, also, it, Happy's hard for me, too, because he, um, still wants to please his father, even though he's seemingly invisible to his father, right? Happy's the one there in the pink shirt. Um, the womanizer, you can see the breakoffs from his character map or prostitutes and this is not a character map I made this is from cliff notes um, but you can see there's really the primary four characters and then um, you know just the little bit parts beyond that uh, we have Howard Howard's very much an archetype and we'll talk about that later today um, but you know Howard is a suit who is uncaring and uh, you know a uh, person who's all about the business and doesn't see the relationships behind it. He uh, is inhumane businessman, which I would say is a huge sort of theme throughout Death of a Salesman is just how American business, um, business is business, you know, that's something that they say over and over again in the play, business is business, and it lacks the humanity, it lacks the social responsibility um, that Arthur Miller thinks it should have. So. Um, so, uh, you may know this already, but Arthur Miller dated and married, um, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, he wrote Death of a Salesman in 1949, and it's set in the present, so, um, you know, we have those sort of post-World War II, um, idealism, optimism that's coming into this play. Um, you know, there's this idea that we're going to rebuild and, um, you know, enjoy the wealth that has been afforded to us. Um, a lot of Arthur Miller's plays are intrinsically political. Um, I would argue that this one is very political. In his biography, um, 
autobiography, he even said that he wanted to show America the corpse of its true believer, uh, which is really grotesque. <laughs> Death of a Salesman is, is Arthur Miller trying to show um, America her her weaknesses, you know, and I think we've come a long way in business since then, but there are definitely still a lot of the things that Miller's talking about, and it's still widely produced, I think, because they're, the criticisms that Miller has for America um, are fair, and so uh, he testified in front of the House Fund American Activities Committee. Uh, he was also, you know, charged with being a communist, but nothing ever came of it. He was never, um, you know, they took away his um, right to travel and a suspended, you know, a lot of suspicions against him. But it was towards the end uh, when McCarthyism was sort of dying out. But a lot of this bitterness that he has towards America, I think, is um, partially because of these infringements on his rights. And he's also son of immigrants, right? Uh, he is of Jewish descent and living in New York City. Um, and uh, so he's seeing a lot of, you know, immigrant optimism and a lot of what he's unpacking in this play is, is skepticism for that. Um, in his autobiography, author Miller also admits that this is based on his uncle, who was um, ruthless in the way that he criticized uh, Miller and um, was constantly thinking of everything as a competition. He had two sons. Uh, Arthur Miller was one of two sons. And it was always a sort of unspoken competition between him and um, uh, he, his family and his uncle's family. And so um, Arthur Miller sat down to write a short story when he was very young and then you know, came back and revisited later with this view sort of, uh, of his uncle. So one of my favorite quotes from the play, Willie Loman says uh, to Harry, his boss, um, when his boss is firing him, uh, you can't eat the orange and throw the peel away. A man is not a piece of fruit. Um, and I think it is an indictment of the way that American businesses um, treat people who've worked at their companies for you know, 35 years. Willie Loman even says that he helped name Harry, right? Um, that his father talked about what to name his son with Willie. That's how long he's been at this company. And, um, and he's saying, you know, you, you're not giving me retirement. You're not taking care of me. They even took him off of a salary base and put him to a purely commission position. Um, and I think, I think that's an indictment against this sort of heartless capitalism that we see rampant. In the simplest terms, you know, the, it is a very complex play, and the way that it jumps through time can be disorienting and hard to stage, um, which I think it's one of those plays that directors are drawn to because it is notoriously hard to stage well. Um, but in, in its simple terms, it's just the 24 hours before Willie Loman dies. It's just his last 24 hours on Earth and his reality in his head. And um, all the flashbacks and all the sort of um, absurd moments, uh, you know, are not grounded in reality. All of those are in his mind. So um, in some ways, it's a very simple play. It's watching a man struggle between his dream, what he thought could have been for himself, for his family, for his house, for his car, <laughs> and versus what they are, right? And you have to remember, this is also the age of capitalistic um, marketing is at an all-time high. I don't know if you're a fan of Mad Men, but I definitely am. Um, and it's it's a time when you're promised, you know, you get that Sears magazine and you see uh, this is a really t relatively new concept, right? This, you get this Sears magazine and now your house needs to look like the Sears magazine. Your wife needs to dress like June Cleaver, right? It's a new boom in unrealistic expectations for America. And now I think a lot of us can sort of laugh at the way that women look in magazines and say, okay, that's ridiculous. We can't, you know, that's photoshopped. And we have realistic expectations about that. But this was a relatively new time. Another thing <clears throat> that we're looking at is sort of um, in a time of 
fiscal prosperity post-war, how do people who aren't succeeding dealing with it, right? Um, we know that Willie has bought it, hook, line, and sinker, the American dream, that if you work hard, you can get a good paycheck. Um, but, um, you know, this is the same sort of themes we see from Risen in the Sun, that the American dream can be disenchanting. It's not a fair system. It's a rigged system in a lot of ways. And so these are the plays that were reg- resonating with audiences, that they were feeling also that that this American dream, um, this shared dream, is disappointing. So the very last lines of the play, which are another one of my favorite lines, come from Linda. And we just see that they had this idea that one day they would be free, right? They spend their whole lives working to maintain their house, working to be able to afford their refrigerator, working to pay off their car. And he talks about that. I just wish for once that I could use something up um, that I wouldn't use something up before I finished paying for it. <laughs> so there's this debt um, debt balance that he lives with. And he says, um, I made, Linda says to the ghost of Willie on the last scene, the very last line of the play, I made the last payment on the house today. Today, there'll be nobody home. Right? That's so sad <laughs> that she's paid for this empty thing. We're free and clear. We're free. We're free. We're free. And I think that speaks to the power of debt on a person's psyche, right? Just feeling like um, making your debts, paying your mortgage every month, and how exhausting that is for the character. And uh, once again, this is another realistic play. Our um, our textbook author, James Thomas, seems to pick a lot of realistic plays. And to be fair, they're the plays that are probably the most produced here in America. Uh, it is realism. They're talking about money. They're talking about um, disappointments. It's the gritty things of life. But it's also got definitely sprinkles of absurdity in there and, um, and surrealism because we're living in a dream world a lot. So um, it, it uh, Linda... Um, is of course it's the night it's 1949 so Linda is mostly powerless to contribute and she sees that her husband is having to borrow money from the neighbor to support them um, but uh, she feels helpless in that situation she can do nothing but darn her old stockings which Willie feels desperately guilty about because he gave stockings to a prostitute once or a woman doesn't necessarily say she's a prostitute although it applies it um, and so he's haunted by his Um, lack of fidelity and uh, that affects their relationship too but like I said I really hate the way Willie talks to Linda it's just really hard for me to listen to or watch or read so we've got this marketing myth that um, you know two and a half kids a perfect pillbox house um, and we see that Loman really enjoys his house when he first Um, in the flashbacks. He's always working on the house, building things, adding to it. Um, But over the years, this promise of this house, his dream for this house, it gets built up with apartment complexes on every side. And all the vegetation is dying in the shade of these apartment tenement housing. And so for him, the idea of what could have been has been dashed. And we see these huge mood swings in the play for Loman between what is and what could be, what is and what could be. And every time they start getting jazzed up about the future, you know, oh, we could own a sporting goods store. Um, You know, we wouldn't have to, uh, we could all live in the same house again. They get all excited. They get all, you know, and then reality comes crashing down when they go to speak to um, the person who might loan them money and he doesn't even, you know, won't even take an appointment with them. Um, you know, so we see these huge um, disappointments throughout the story, um, which I think is is very poignant and even the more tragic, even the harder to watch. So um, moving back to our textbook, we are in a very important chapter over character. Um, and James Thomas um, starts with objectives. And we spoke about this in the first chapter. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, I forgot to make a slide for character, but I think it's worth saying that in the modern way, some of us think of character as sort of um, 
our value system or um, or you know our character being you know are you kind are you loving but really when we talk about character in terms of um, theater we're talking about patterns of behavior right patterns of behavior and kind of trying to get at how does my character act right what is what is their what is their psychology as they live it out and that's very important what are their objectives I think is the first thing that um, that Thomas rightly points to and we see that the objective is the character's specific goals that he's trying to achieve he or she is trying to achieve right so you have to look at a play and I think he rightly says we're not doing a full psychoanalyst analysis right um, this is an imaginary fictional character and for the sake of brevity a lot of our playwrights have very clear goals very few of us you know I might wake up in the morning and decide I'm gonna record this lecture um, but then by the end of the day I've been distracted by my son I've been distracted by my husband right uh, been distracted by dirty laundry and I might not achieve my objective very rarely in in plays do we see characters not at least attempt their objectives all right they're they're very rarely just sit on the couch for two and a half hours <laughs> and Netflix and chill when they should be doing their laundry uh, they achieve their goals um, so it's not fair to sort of look at them as a psychologist would we're looking at them as a theater artist and how does it tell the story um, when you figure out what a character wants right that famous um, <laughs> method actor question uh, what does my character want uh, when you figure out what they want you can tap into why for example they're so disappointed why um, why they have a strong emotional reaction at one time or another if you can base that in the subtext of what they want that maybe maybe it's never said aloud in the play and it's a bit of a mystery but if you can dig in kind of sink your teeth in and figure it out for yourself and help justify emotional reactions then you're going to be a better actor it's going to make logical sense to you and then the audience will be able to follow it right if it's not an absurd play but here's a famous quote after all the highways and the trains and the appointments and the years you end up worth more dead than alive it's so sad gosh it's a sad play um, you know Lomans wanted to be liked over and over again we see that Loman in the play wanted to be liked and uh, he's constantly worried about whether or not his boys are liked if uh, part of the, his disenchantment with his salesman job is because he goes to Boston no longer feels liked part of the reason he chose to be a salesman is because he wanted to be liked and I think when he commits suicide at the end of the play when he gets in that car and drives full speed uh, into his death I do think he is trying to still please people he's a people pleaser up until the very end he knows that if he kills himself there will be uh, insurance money to pay off the house he knows there will be um, money to provide for his boys um, and that's part of the sadness of this extreme capitalism we see depicted in death of a salesman and the same question that I think uh, Mama Lena asked of Ruth, you know, why would you abort this baby? Why, when did money become more important than human life? And I think that Loman's asking the same, thinking in the same brass tacks and saying, you know, my life isn't worth that much, but that insurance money that my, my wife would get if I died and she wouldn't have to support me anymore, I'd be one less mouth to feed. So we have this sort of twisted logic um, that displays Loman's values displays his character but also his objectives right he wants to be liked and when you have nothing left but your life to give you know that's kind of the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet too they don't have any decisions left um, but their own life you know that's what they can sacrifice all right he calls this term qualities and I have to be honest I have never heard it called what qualities I put it in parenthesis there because I've always heard it called tactics um, if you uh, take my acting class I call it tactics uh, the Cohen um, book acting book that we use the goat uh, the T and goat is tactics uh, the so behaviors they employ to achieve objectives 
right? So, and if this is your first time sort of being exposed to this concept that we try different tactics in order to get what we want, it can sort of come off as manipulative initially. And you say, oh, I'm not that, I'm not that contriving. Um, but it, you should spend some time with toddlers because <laughs> when you strip away um you know, all the, the niceties and the way that we're expected to behave in polite, polite uh, society, then you really start to look at how um, the tactics that people use, right? They, if my son wants a cookie, for example, right, he might first try to steal the cookie. Well, he's too little, he can't get up on the counter. And then he might come to me and, and give me the puppy dog eyes and say, uh, please, and I'll say, no, you need to eat something real first. And then he'll try to negotiate, okay, is cake real? No, cake isn't real food. It, you know, we go through, finally, he eats all of his chicken nuggets and he can have his cookie. But but usually in a play, for the purposes of the play, you try different tactics in order to get your goal. And this is, once again, those shades of um, variation that we talked about last class when we talked about beats and units. You want to add variety. And you as an actor, if you're just trying the same exact tactic, please, please, please can I have a cookie? Please can I have a cookie? Please can I have a cookie? Right? Then <laughs> it's going to come across as Johnny One Note. It's going to have no variety. But if you see the different um, ways, right? First, um, to beg please, right, to demand, no, give me a cookie, right, and you try different objectives, you try different, no, sorry, you had the same objective to get that cookie, but you try different tactics, and they're all um, begin with two, um, and, and followed by a verb, because we want to keep it future tense, and we want to keep it active towards the other person, and once again, when you take acting class, we'll unpack this even more, um, but I think that's one of the reasons that actors are drawn to Willie Loman, is he's desperate, he is in his last 24 hours on, per, uh, on earth, and he is willing to do anything, right? Obviously, he sacrifices his life. But the way that he talks to Biff, you know, he has, he changes his mind a lot, right? He's not all there. He's gone around the bend, as my daddy would say. Um, but he threatens Biff. He, uh, you know, he guilts him. He shames him. He praises him. He tries to give him hope. It, it's this whole range of emotions and this whole range of tactics that he employs in order to try to see Biff succeed, right? Um, and so when you have that variation in your tactics, and still the same objective, but when you have that sort of variation in your tactics, you, especially when the stakes are high, when these characters are pushed in a corner, Right. You may have, have heard, you know, in Arthur Miller's other play, The Crucible, uh, The Crucible is a metaphor for, um, you know, when you're put under fire. A, a crucible is something that if you heat it up to a very high heat, it doesn't lose its shape. So you can use it to mold other metals and make something um, and so when he writes these extreme melodramatic situations, you know, such as the Salem Witch Trial, he has those characters who don't change under pressure, who don't, um, who aren't, whose metal isn't melted. And so um, he likes to write these characters who are kind of put in a corner. Uh, and and I, d I think that appeals to actors to see these really high st stakes situation with lots of behavior um, variation in order to achieve their objectives. They're desperate characters. Uh, you know, it's funny to me that Willie Loman is still kind of trading in his athleticism. You know, he's still threatening to punch his best friend. He's still, um, you know, threatening to whip his sons, even if it isn't a flashback. Um, but, you know, he's He's not writing, when we look at a play like Ibsen, it can be very fun to act these parts, but he, you know, Ibsen and Chekhov write in a lot of subtext. There's a lot of beating around the bush. Arthur Miller is writing in this play very straightforward. You know, often we don't have to wonder what is Loman thinking. He, he says it out loud, what he's thinking, because he's so desperate, which I think really appeals to actors who want to challenge. So we have different types of conflict 
in script analysis. And sometimes that conflict comes from what um, a character what a character thinks and then what another character thinks, right? So sometimes the tensions are in identity and in, um, so for example, it's kind of a, a hard thing to wrap around, but the tensions that arise between characters opposing views. So Linda um, really thinks that Biff is responsible. She knows that her husband is suicidal and she knows how desperate the situation is. And she really thinks that Biff needs to move back into their house, move back from Texas into this um, New York home and, uh, you know, lie to Willie. <laughs> Not just normal familial, you know, loyalty or obeying your parents. Uh, she really thinks that, that Biff ought to lie. <laughs> and that, um, you know, she doesn't presumably had this knowledge that Biff has. Biff knows that Willie cheated on his wife, right? His senior year in high school, he shows up to the hotel room, he sees her there, he tries to lie his way out of it, but Willie can't charm her and um, charm Biff, you know, Biff knows. And, and that's when Biff starts this idea that this is all fake. And we're all telling each other lies. And I won't be part of these lies. I, I want to be a person about truth. But Willie um, is very, uh, haunted by this Biff relationship and, and feeling, of you know, like his son doesn't believe in him. But Linda, sorry, back to the role conflict example, Linda really thinks that Biff ought to be the good, play the good son. And Biff really doesn't think that he owes Willie anything. And he really thinks, I think truly Biff believes that he's better to his father if he just stays out of the picture, causes him less stress. You know, everybody says, when, Biff, when you come around, Willie kind of goes around the bend. He kind of gets a little crazy. And Biff, I think his solution is just pretend like you don't have a son. Pretend like Happy's your only son. Uh, you know, I'd rather just not be part of this. But obviously, Willie's very invested because even when Biff's not around, he's talking to the ghost of Biff. He's talking to these memories of Biff and and so the conflict arises when Linda thinks this is Buff's, Biff's role and Biff thinks he has a different role. So it's more um, a clashing of expectations around what people think they ought to do. More often, though, we have a conflict of objectives, right? When different characters have different opposing goals. And this is kind of the traditional protagonist, antagonist. You know, Batman wants to save Gotham, Bane wants to destroy it, you know, opposing goals. <laughs> um, Biff wants to live off the land. He wants to have a life that's outdoors. He doesn't want to accumulate a lot of crap, right? I think Biff would, would buy a tiny house <laughs> um, and um, be part of the tiny house movement if he were in modern America. Whereas, uh, you know, we see Willie wanted a big home and, and took on that mortgage and it disappointed him. So, um, and Biff wants that for, Willie wants that for Biff. Willie wants him to live in his home. He's, you know, I've finally got this thing paid off. Wouldn't it be great if my son lived in it? And um, so we just have a conflict in, in goals, right? What, what Biff sees for himself and what Willie sees for Biff are two different things. And that's really the heart of the story is, um, is, and you could argue, once again, script analysis, uh, dramaturgy is something that is debatable and affects the way you stage it. So you need to decide if you're the director, if Willie Loman is the protagonist or if Biff is the protagonist. Personally, I think if the play is named after the person, Hamlet and Hamlet, Willie Loman and Death of a Salesman, I think he's the protagonist. But it could be argued that Biff is our protagonist because it's really his life that's also on the line in his future. So willpower, when we're talking about character, willpower is the degree of force with which characters pursue their goal. The degree of force, right? Um, and usually Aristotle would argue that our protagonists, our heroes need to have grit. They need to be characters who work hard for their goals, right? Um, but we see in our textbook here that he has examples of, of characters who are less than gritty, um, but still are able to succeed, right? So, um, 
passive characters uh, such as he uses Mother Courage kind of as an example of a character that's overly passive, um, but still doesn't seem to give up. I would argue that Willie Loman is very passionate, and part of the reason that even though he's so flawed, uh, he's a womanizer, he has um, kind of bought into a capitalistic ideal that I think... Um, to an unrealistic extent, you know, he doesn't seem to, the laws of gravity, <clears throat> the laws of gravity don't seem to apply to Willie Loman. Um, but he's, t- he's technically weak, right? He's, he's an older man. He's can't seem to make a living. He's pitiable in those ways, but he has a lot of force left in him. He's still coming out, uh, throwing punches, um, which I think, if you're playing, <coughs> if you, sorry, I'm having throat problems here. I'm going to take another drink here. Um, if you're playing a character, you always want to play them with a lot of willpower. Play them as, um, as a character who's willing to fight for what they want, right? Uh, Willie really worries about Biff's lack of willpower, he, in the very first scene, acute says, you know, he hasn't even made $35 a week yet. And he calls it the greatest country in the world. He's personally attractive. He's a hard worker. Um, but he's he's not driven, right? He wants something different. And so, of course, we know that Biff just has a different set of values that he's operating on. And that's why he lacks the willpower. And by values, we mean, obviously, just, you know, what they think are good or bad, right? And and they're different for everybody. As I've already said, Willie Loman's values are being liked. Be liked and you'll never want, right? Um, be liked, be liked, and that's going to pay the bills, right? Uh, which is just blind optimism, right? The when you feel like you're a salesman like that, you trade in personality. I have to admit, my my father, uh, my husband's grandfather, when I first met my husband and we were dating, he was working with his grandfather and he had been a salesman uh, very similar to this, you know, on the road. He was selling houses, um, modular homes, uh, and he was always selling and um I got to see him in his prime, thankfully, because 10 years later, you know, we've been married for a while now, and he was in a home, and we would visit him, and he would still be selling. Let me tell you about this opportunity. And of course, you know, he's, he's lost his marbles a little bit, Grandpa Jack had, and he, he would still be selling. Uh, because, you know, when you when you value something, when you get into this groove, and you feel like this is your calling in life, um, you, it's hard to just turn that off in, in your old age. And, um, you know, that was Grandpa Jack's role. He was a salesman. He was always selling. He was always charming. And um, it's interesting to see how when you take on a role like that as your vocation, that even when you're no longer being paid to do it, it's still sort of this, you know, something you can't just put down, especially if you've been in a vocation. You know, nowadays, it's probably harder for us to think about because, uh, people change jobs all the time, but this was also a time when somebody did the same thing for 50 years, 30 years, uh, and it becomes part of their identity. And I try to, I know this sounds so cheesy, but I try when I am introduced to someone not to immediately ask them, what do you do? Um, because I think, you know, we do need to understand that people are more than what they do for a living and how they make money. Um, I think that's part of what Miller's warning us against is just sort of um, turning people into commodities. And then values are also just your point of view, right? To Arthur Miller's success, uh, not to Arthur Miller, to Willie Lohman, success was making at least $35 a week. Success was succeeding in football. Right. If my son is a star quarterback, good for him. But that that's not my necessarily what will make me proud. Right. But what a character values, what they trade in, what do they 
kind of see as important um, is something you need to decide for your character, especially if your values are completely alien from the person you're playing. Right. And this can be hard when you're playing a villain to sort of understand why what is what is leading them to these killing someone and what is leading them to the ex extreme behaviors. And rather than just judging that character and saying, oh, I'm a bad guy, -ha, unless you're doing a melodrama, um, you have to say, OK, well, this person is fighting for their life. This person, you know, needs to steal this money in order to live or to get the house that they feel like they need. Getting into their point of view, getting into their value system can help you to portray the character with empathy rather than with judgment. So when you decide, when you're in that character, you've decided their objectives, you've decided their values, you're in their head, now it's time to get into their body. Right? Now, obviously, Death of a Salesman, most of you who I'm talking to are not in, you know, past middle age or not in your final 24 hours on earth so you would probably have to begin with physicalization right um, how does a character walk when they're that old how does a character speak when they're that old so looking at the physical and vocal marks of a character um, now sometimes if you're doing a naturalistic play you don't need to really change your voice or body that much in order to portray a character right uh, when you're doing gritty acting like this, having the character's physicalization as close to your own as possible. You know, if you were playing Happy or Biff or uh, Linda, you may not have to take on a large physical. Um, but you also carry sadness in your body, right? When you have um, your psychology affects your physiology and your physiology affects your psychology. So it's funny when I was looking for pictures to include in this PowerPoint, how many of them showed this man looking at the ground, this downtrodden looking businessman, and how it becomes kind of iconic of Death of a Salesman, this way that we see the weight of the world on a businessman's shoulders. So the way you carry yourself, um, in, a, in a good play, you know, we should be able to just take pictures and still be able to tell the story, even without the words. So making sure that you're t telling that story physically. Now, if I'm hired to play one of those prostitutes in the same play, right? How does a prostitute carry herself? How does she need to use her body in order to make a living, right? So when we take on a character, we need to take on their physical traits as well. So when are they shy? When are they more um, impatient? What sort of raises their blood pressure, right? And it, when we look at um, Arthur Miller's, you know, then wife, Marilyn Monroe, uh, she was a true method actor, and she believed in the Stanislavski method. And she was notoriously hard to work with on set because she would wait until she was in her body, in her character, um, until she would say the lines. And uh, she really wanted it to be authentic, right, by the time she really got into method acting. But it can also um, take its toll on you psychologically and physically to sort of live in these characters and live in their minds. Um, and I would argue that, you know, her recklessness with the pills and, and the way that she died and many um, actors that kind of were pushed into addiction at this time, I think part, partly because of this psychological work where they didn't have clear boundaries between them and the characters. This can be very dangerous. <clears throat> Your personality can just be, you know, how you relate to other people. Some of you are naturally going to walk down the hall and smile and wave at every car that passes, proverbially speaking, and others of you are more closed off. So looking at the differences between your personality and your character's personality are vital to portraying that character fairly, right? Um, you have to get out of your own body, out of your own voice, out of your own perspective, and into that character's. So... When we're looking at characters, we have to remember that there are archetypes and then there are complex characters, right? And t some people will hear this lecture and they'll kind of knee jerk against me here and say that, you know, types are, um, types are bad acting. 
you know. And I do think that stereotyping a character based on their race, religion, or gender can be, you know, nah, not good. We don't want to do stereotyping. But sometimes, especially if you are doing a skit, doing a short play, doing um, a, a walk-on role, if you're communicating through a type, then the audience is going to register it instantly and they're going to know, you know, if you're, if you're playing blonde cheerleader and you come in playing a stereotypical blonde cheerleader, um, then your audience automatically knows and can attach meaning to your character in a way that is, a, that is fast, right? Um, I, I read a lot of actor biographies. That's one of my favorite reading things. And, um, you know, it's funny how many of them complain about being stuck in a type. So, for example, Lauren Graham, who's um, famously played on Gilmore Girls, she, uh, the mother in Gilmore Girls, she kind of in the 90s and and early uh, thousands, she, she, 2000, she got stereotyped as this working mother, right? She always played this sort of busy businesswoman and how exhausting it was for her to play this overly simple character over and over again, right? And we see it in romantic comedies all the time. Busy woman doesn't have time for love. It's just kind of a type that we see. And she has her audition outfits, you know, laid out based on what her type is. I will say for those of you who are actors that it's important to know physically which type you're default to, Right. Even when I was in my early 20s, when I was in my late teens, when I was a student, I was still archetyped as a mother. Right. And part of that was my build. I matured very early and, um, you know, always had this sort of maternal voice as well. I played a little bit older than I was. And so I knew when I looked at a script that I could, you know, go into an audition and get that bigger part that I might want if it was a mother, if I dressed a certain way at auditions, if I presented myself, um, you know, lowered my voice a little bit, uh, whatever the case may be. If you if you look at what your type is, sometimes it can save you some heartache in expecting a different kind of type, right? I, as a full-figured woman, was not going to be cast as a child unless I had a really creative director who had a certain mindset about casting against type, Right. Um, But figuring out your type can cause you um, to sort of hone in on what roles you're really eligible for. And uh, if you can play a child really well, if you have that baby face, right, then go for that part. But if you're, like I said, I was a full figured woman, I knew I had a chance at those maternal parts. And those were often parts that I wanted to play complex characters with, um, you know, meaningful kind of uh, pain. This is the picture here is blackout poetry from Death of a Salesman, which I think is a really, I like blackout poetry. I think it's interesting to sort of string these things together. Once again, we see this admittance, right? Immobilizing sadness. I, I, there are very few men in my life who speak with such raw emotion. And I think it's beautiful that Arthur Miller gives this character who speaks in raw emotion like that. But, Howard Wagner is a type. He's a heartless businessman. Now the opposite of working in types is working in complexity, right? If you have a character who is self-aware, who is um, the main character, he's probably going to be, he or she is going to be more complex, right? And if we have um, a protagonist of a story, right, they're probably going to have more complexity. Part of the question you might ask is whether Biff is the, is the protagonist, because Biff is equally as complex. <laughs> he is really dealing with multi-layers and wrestling with the truths of it. So um, really, uh, like I said, if I have a walk-on role, you know, and I'm playing blonde cheerleader, there's a very small chance that I'm going to have complexities in that character, right? If I only have three lines, there's a chance there's not a lot of complexity there. Now, and that doesn't mean that I can't still act that part well or get a laugh or, or, you know, enjoy the scene, but as a actor, I may be looking and mining for details that just aren't there, 
right? It's it's hard to apply all of this rigorous script analysis to minor characters because it may just not be in the script. And that, you know, to to be fair, you can go and imagine a full-bodied life for this person in order to create a meaningful character on stage, but really our main characters are going to be the ones with complexity, which I think is part of my problem with Linda, that she just doesn't have a lot of complexity because she's not a main character. Um, but, uh, you know, when we look at uh, character, it... Um, it's something that can be probably one of the more intuitive sides for actors. You know, you've been maybe doing this for a long time and you've never really sat down to think about how to get into a character, how to get into a character's head. But it's something that we do pretty intuitively. Um, a part of, you know, the time we are old enough to talk, we're playing make-believe, we're playing pretend. Um, and really the key to to developing a full character is reading the script carefully and it can be easy to idealize a character especially if you're playing someone like Willie Loman who is sort of a flawed character and painfully um, flawed but when you sit down and look at all of the details and make sure you're including every you know side of this character all of the complexities and putting that into a character that you can act on stage and so don't don't, try not to whitewash your characters. Try not to judge your characters because if you judge them, then you won't play them empathically. Um, try to get in their head and, and see what makes them tick and let that be what guides you through your performance. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture over Death of a Salesman. Thank you for listening. <laughs>